but you have to know how to do these measurements, right? right. Uh, okay, so what we're talking about is the ferrous 6 plus 4, all right? And I thought it'd be helpful to go over the ferrous 6 plus 4 so that you guys know how to input the data because the data is only as good as the way that you assess it. And we have to make sure that we're all standardized and on the same page. The first element of the ferrous 6 plus 4 is nasal breathing. Can this individual breathe through their nose right here, right now, for three minutes? It's a simple yes or no. Does this patient demonstrate signs of mentalis strain? This is the mentalis muscle. The mentalis muscle is a compensation for open mouth posture. So the mouth wants to be open, like the tongue tie wants to hold the tongue down, but you're compensating. Just as with tongue tie, where you're compensating with the floor of mouth, you can compensate for vertical growth and lip ties and retronathia by over-engaging the mentalis muscle. The solution to this is not Botox. Botox will only make it worse. This is a compensation. Rather, getting to the root cause, you know, lip tie releases, orthodontic treatment, bringing the lower jaw forward, uh, can be a big help. That's mentalis strain. The next is tonsils. You're going to look into the oral pharynx and assess whether the tonsils have been removed. Zero or occupied by 25% of the airway, grade one. 25 to 50%, grade two. 51 to 75 or more than more than 75% of the airway. If it's more than 75% of the airway, you're going to advocate for tonsillectomy. If it's grade three, then this is an observation, like compensating, all right? Is it large because you have allergies, recent infection? Can we try myro first? Can you breathe through the nose? Let's see. If it goes beyond 6 to 12 months and it's associated with symptoms of, of nasal obstructions, if disordered breathing, we advocate for treatment. Tongue tie. Can you, you know, are you hypermobile with your tongue, which in and of itself is not desirable, okay? Are you appropriately mobile, uh, you know, limited, okay, or very restricted? Are there signs of dental wear? Dental wear is a sign of grinding, acid reflux, jaw clenching, upper airway obstruction, especially during sleep. Are there signs of a narrow palate, dental crying, high arch or narrow palate, as these are often associated with tongue space limitations. These are the first six of the ferrous six. Everyone's good with these, yes? What's often confusing is the additional six plus four that we have developed based on our research that's gonna be published this year, all right? And these four additional factors are tongue scalloping, tongue overflow, Friedman tongue position, the palatal flutter. Tongue scalloping, okay? You ask the patient to swallow, then stick your tongue out, okay? When they stick their tongue out, you look for these signs of these bite marks all over the tongue, all right? If you're seeing these bite marks, they're like scallops, all right? And you can have normal, mild, moderate, or severe. Tongue scalloping can be due to limited tongue space, but it can also be due to low tongue posture and tongue thrusting, okay? The next one that we look for, and the, perhaps the most important factor for me, is tongue overflow. Does the tongue extend over the lingual surface of the maxillary teeth? Look here. Here it's just, you see this? It's just extending over the maxillary surface, of the, the lingual surface of the maxillary teeth, okay? So this is normal range, well encapsulated. So this is just extending a little bit out. Does it extend beyond the central groove? Okay. Does it extend onto the buccal aspect when the tongue is up in lingual palatal suction? All right. If you're seeing severe tongue overflow, you're probably going to want to have a CT scan. All right. If they're accommodating nicely, they're mild, you probably get away with it. Okay. This is probably 34 millimeter intermolar width. Okay. Uh, this is probably like 32, 33. This is going to be 30 millimeters less than 32 millimeter intermolar width. Yeah. So like they're narrow, but they're able to, you know, accommodate. Them. You'll be safe. Yeah, if they're able to accommodate, you'll probably be safe. Mm -hmm. Like petite, they have a small tongue. You'll be, you'll probably be okay, but uh, you may still want to talk to them about palate expansion and all that. Friedman tongue position is one that we have in there because in the literature, it's not a great tool. I'll tell you why. Okay, if you're breathing through the nose, the tongue will look like it's up. This has to be done with mouth breathing. Okay, so you say, go ahead and open up your mouth. Okay, breathe through your mouth, just open gently, and you see at, at, at you know, a bit horizontal visual access, patient sitting upright, are you able to see the back of the throat? It's not that reliable, a little adjustment, a little up, down, a little breathing will, will totally throw it off. So it's not reliable. However, 
if it's a Friedman tongue form, no matter what, okay, up, down, for the life of you, you can't see it, that's when you score it. So you're going to score the best one that they can do, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, it's, yes. So, for like, if you're trying to look at the tonsils and yeah. they have a Friedman report, how do you, like, do you have any tips to... Yeah, so you can, you put their head back, okay, <laughs> okay. put a shoulder roll, put their head back, stick out your tongue and you'll see it for sure. Oh, okay. Okay? But this is done like upright sitting, you say, okay, let me see, ah, oh, ah, oh, you can't see it? Friedman tongue four, it's a problem. If it's a three or a two, you're okay. If it's a one, then you're good. Yeah? Okay. Uh, the other one is palatal flutter sign, all right? The palatal flutter sign is super useful, okay? Uh, so here's how it's going to work, all right? What you're trying to do is sell someone on, like, myofunctional therapy, right? Tongue up, lips closed, healthy breathing through the nose. You're trying to sell them on that, right? So what you're going to do is give them a preview of what it would be like. So you say, go ahead and make this snoring sound. Go ahead and make it. Okay? You hear that snoring sound. You're going to tell them, by working with me for 10 sessions, we're going to work on nasal breathing, tongue posture, lift seal. So go ahead, put your tongue up to the palate. Okay, now try to snore. You see, when you put your tongue up, everything is better. <laughs> come work with me. Come get the nasal breathing, come get the mile, come get the tongue tie. We're going to be successful. However, that's positive sign. However, if they put their tongue up and they're still like, like roaring, okay, you're not going to be successful with therapy. Come on, right? You're not going to have any success. You say, you know what? You may not be a good candidate for myofunctional therapy. We're going to need a CT scan, sleep study, there's a lot of other issues. We can make some success, but honestly, I think you need to look at the bigger picture because tongue tie is only one cause of limited tongue mobility. I think you may have a tongue space issue. Hit the button on insights, get the CT scan, hit the button for the sleep study too while you're at, while you're, while you're at it, all right? And move them on to the to the next to the next pathway. This is a functional tongue space analysis, ranging from <coughs> tongue overflow, okay, uh, you know, tongue scalloping, Friedman tongue position, all right, and palatal flutter sign. Questions, comments on these? Yes. So, um, a nine-year-old uh -huh. or a seven-year-old, yeah, with a high narrow vault and a tongue tie. Good question. Good question. So the order of what you're going to do. Absolutely. So children are different from adults, okay? Adults, you're going to decide if you treat or not, okay? You have like a 70-year-old, an 80-year-old, okay? They made it like this far, and like hanging in there, <laughs> all right? You're not about to be like, oh, MMA, tongue tie, tonsils, nose. They made it this far, right? You give, you give them a little discount. But if it's like a three or four or five-year-old, you're going to treat to perfection, okay? You're going to want them to have everything squared away. The tongue up, tongue ties addressed, tonsil small, palate wide, it's going to be it's a different story. So in adults, we decide, do you really need to have treatment? In kids, we're treating to prevent early identification, get it, get it to go. Now, which one do you do first? Do you do the myo tongue tie first? Do you do the tonsils first? Do you do the palate expander first? You're going to treat whatever is the most severe, okay? So if you have a severe tongue tie, all right, well, hey, that makes more sense. Then go into the palate expander. You treat the tongue tie first, it'll help with the palate expansion. Now, if you have a very narrow palate and like a compensated tongue tie, you don't know, expand first, okay? Because when you expand, now the myo can improve, you can get a better result from your intervention. So you have a palate expander in the mouth. Yeah. The kid is still limited, doesn't have the R. Restricted or compensated? Compensated. Compensated, you wait. You wait, because with the expander there, you're not going to get the R's with the expander. You're going to be limiting your therapy. But not just, not just, the R's, uh -huh. it's, it's the, the nasal breathing too. So do you do, you do some myo? You could, you could, but it depends on where the patient's coming from and where their uh, finances are and how much resources they have. So mm -hmm. some families come with unlimited resources, then you do myo now, myo here, myo later. <laughs> some have little appetite for it. And they want mine. Uh, yeah. yeah, and some are just like they're limited their resources. So when do you think you'll be most effective at your intervention? because you want the patient to walk in, walk out highly satisfied. And if you have a case where they have nasal obstruction, they have adenoids, narrow palate, all this, they're not gonna walk in, walk out. They're gonna walk in and be like, he's still not better. How much more therapy? How much more therapy? I work with Devora, and oh, she just wants to do therapy forever, okay? Do you really want that patient in your clinic? You only have space for 20 patients to see a week, okay? Who here sees more than 20 patients a week? Anybody? As a therapist? Yeah. yeah. How many of you guys seeing? 
30 or 40 or what? what? Um, How many hours do you guys do in a week in the clinic? A lot. Yeah, we do probably 40 to 50. How much? 40 to 50? 40 to 50 a week. What, 30, 30 minute sessions or what? Yeah. 30 minute sessions. Yeah. Okay. So you yes. yeah. So, so, uh, you know, so then you got to know that you only have 30 to 40 session spots yes. over a two month period. Okay. And who you want taking up those spots. You have to have an abundance mentality. All right. And I would suggest that it's better for your practice to get highly engaged parents in and out, in and out. You don't have people coming on forever, 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 forever. Oh, I've been in speech therapy for two years. I didn't get any results. I've been in speech therapy. They got me in. They got me out. Okay? Like very focused. And if they can breathe, they have the time space, you address these issues, you'll have high success, everyone's happy, you're happy, better Google reviews, better Yelp, everyone's happy. You guys with me? All right, other questions? Yeah. So for babies, is it ever not indicated for like a high and narrow palate if they're having functional issues? Great question. So for babies, you can actually intervene for the high and narrow palate with palatal stretches. You can stretch out the palate. They have a bubble palate that they're born with, and you can stretch it with your fingers. And then like occupational therapy stretching out <laughs> if the lower uh, if the lower jaw is recessed, okay? Uh, often jaws because they have so much tension here. So the tummy time really helps the lower jaw uh, kind of grow outwards. Okay, also how they're posturing the baby. If they're holding it like this in the car seat all day long, it's not gonna be good. So you want them to be like open and like out, not like this. Good. Alright. Uh, so we talked about palatal flutter signs. So you do your CT skin. The CT scan has to be done according to the Breathe Institute protocol for it to be valid. Otherwise, it's not worth looking at. It's not worth having, okay? Natural head position, horizontal visual access, close the mouth, breathe through the nose, place the teeth together, swallow once, then rest for your tongue where it naturally goes. No bite registration and no chin rest. When you use a bite registration, it goes inside the mouth, pushes the tongue into the throat, you can't see anything. When you use a chin rest, it automatically pushes the tongue up. That's number one pushes the tongue up, so, you, so your low tongue because you're not going to catch it. You're going to see high tongue position. All right. Number two, the chin rest, they come forward, the airway looks bigger. So the chin rest, when you do it, the airway looks big, your tongue is up, everything is good, you missed all your findings. Yeah. Do you guys understand why we don't want a chin rest? For sure. Now if you're doing implant surgery or something like that, then by all means, open up their mouth real wide and extend their head back and do whatever you want. That's a different indication. But if you're doing it for airway analysis, horizontal visual access, no chin rest, no bite registration, breathe through the nose, swallow once, rest your tongue where it naturally goes. This is the same patient in two different uh, head postures. You can see the airway is much bigger here. You can see the maxilla is pointed downwards. Here the maxilla is pointed upwards. Here the maxilla is neutral. Here it's pointed downwards. The head and neck posture directly affects the airway. For every five degrees you go up, it alters the airway by 25%. Okay. 10 degrees alters it by 88%, 20 degrees by 150%. Uh, the nasion, basion, C3 angle should be around 105 to 110. If it's like 120, 125, that's where you're maxed out. If you start at 105 and you get airway swelling, well, you can go to 110, you can go to 115, but you can't go more than 125, okay? And that's when you're gonna get problems. So you have some room to compensate. The head and neck angle is a compensation for a restricted airway just like floor of mouth hole, just like mentalis strain, and that's where you really have your fine eye. That even though the airway is wide, it's at the risk of a uh, compensated posture. It can be helpful to measure the intermolar distance. The intermolar distance is measured from the mesial lingual cusp of the permanent first molars. Here's some ranges to consider.